Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to YAS, your African supply chain podcast. I'm your host, Stella Jaqueta. And in this podcast, we discuss various topics that affect my beautiful, your beautiful, uncomplicated African supply chains. And in this t- episode, we will be talking about the future of supply chain is now. And I have a wonderful guest and I consider him a futurist and a thought leader when it comes to supply chain. So let me introduce you guys to Sean Cooley. And let me tell you a little bit about Sean because his bio, his profile is out of this world. So Sean Cooley is an award-winning keynote speaker on supply chain transformation and disruptive technologies. He is also the author of Transition Point from STEM to Singularity, an in-depth examination of the causes of technological progress and how the current wave of change will disrupt our business model, economy, and society at large. So you guys, do yourself a favor, buy this book. Trust me. (laughs) He has over 25 years of experience in supply chain and technology, working across multiple industries, vertical from FMCGs to the UN and aerospace and defense. Sean is also a visiting fellow at Cranfield University, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, Transformation Advisor for the Association of Supply Chain Management, and a score master instructor. He has recently been working with a Silicon Valley AI company on the new field of decision intelligence and is currently the head of supply chain for the Manufacturing Technology Center, the UK's innovation hub designed to bridge the gap between academic research and industrial application. So as you guys can see by the profile, When it comes to future of supply chain, Sean is your guy. And I personally read Sean's book and for me, it was like mind blowing. (laughs) And so ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Sean Cooley. Sean, how are you? Welcome to YAS. Stella, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today. It's a real pleasure to be here and to meet you. And also to speak to all your guests as well, and your listeners. Yes, yes, Sean, thank you for availing yourself and to really discuss about this topic that this future of supply chain is now. And just to get started, what does, what does the future of supply chain look like for you personally? I think supply chain is a very interesting area to be involved in at the moment. It's, it's a topic that's gone from being very niche. In fact, even the concept of the word supply chain wasn't really clearly defined. It depended on the industry. It depended on the company to it being a headline news article all the time. Ever since COVID then we've seen happened and we've seen all of the supply chain issues arise out of that and about this, the Suez Canal issues happened and, and of course the semiconductor shortages coming out of China. Supply chain has been something that's been brought very much into the living room of pretty much everybody now. So it's an exciting industry to be in, but it's also one that's gone for a huge amount of transformation right now. It's an area that has relied very much on human labor in the past. You need human hands to pick, pack, load, drive, move goods around to one where automation is increasingly increasing significantly on today street. So I think that, you know, after years I've, I've sort of spoken and talked about how the future of the supply chain is what I call PAL, which is a very personal. So we moved from sort of mass manufacturing and mass marketing into a much more customized suite of products and services. It's become increasingly automated end to end and using tools like robotics and autonomous vehicles and drones and all these technologies we've been talking about for a while now, but also very interesting it's going to become much more local. We've gone through a big process of globalization where we've been shipping products from around the world. And we now realize that that's quite a fragile supply chain, but also not a particularly sustainable one. So there's a big movement at the moment to sort of shorten the supply chain. So I think the future supply chain is going to be fairly personable are much more customized, very automated, and increasingly yeah. more local and sustainable. Yes. And Sean, and I think just to comment on COVID-19, there was this drive about localizing or having local industry of reshoring, bringing back the, in- the industries that were previously overseas. Let's say if they had a manufacturer mm-hmm. in China or in Indonesia, now bring it back to home country. Do you think this will still continue being a trend 
Or do you think companies are now back to business? Let's continue doing what we were doing before. Is you um, see I, that I will, happening? Yeah, I do, I do think it'll be a trend and I think it'll be a trend that will accelerate. And I think the thing that will take over from COVID will be the push for net zero and, and the sustainability movement, the, you know, the, the short and, and also the, 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 the constant disruption that we're seeing globally through geopolitical issues with the conflict in Ukraine, the ability to have you know, the key components of your supply chain will be in sort of safe, profitable proximity is going to be a massive driver, I think, for both CEOs, CSCOs and, and CFOs worldwide. One of the other things, because it's the push for net zero, I think the push for net zero will take over from COVID as being the sort of major sort of accelerant into this movement towards reshoring. Automation now makes it possible for companies to manufacture things yeah. at a price point that's probably as competitive, if not cheaper than it was when using cheap human labor out in China and or you know Eastern Europe, wherever. So I think companies now are looking at automation as a way to reshore manufacturing into locations where you know they can transport it quickly, they can have a more agile supply chain. It's, it's problematic if you're shipping stuff across from China and then takes six weeks on the water and True. suddenly. The you know, the demand changes or, you know, people, you know, government locks people down or whatever you, you can't, you know, that, that supply chain is already in motion. So we need a much more agile supply chain. And I think, you know, a more local, stronger, in some cases, more automated supply chain will, will give people the agility that they're actually looking for. So, yeah, yeah I think it's a trend. I think also that the people are trying to bridge the gap between that world and the existing world by continuing it. some of their existing contracts and cons and we've seen things like the semiconductor shortages realize that we, we still require manufacturing in far away, you know, countries in order to do that because the resources to, to manufacture those things are still there. So we can't pull the plug potentially as quickly as people may wish to, yeah. but it's absolutely, it's absolutely a direction of travel. Yeah. And I think it's also an opportunity for local companies, local businesses to really thrive. If, I think, yeah, exactly. if these, exactly. yeah, if these yeah. companies are coming back, they need somewhere, they need suppliers, they need to invest on the local, local community. So I think it's, this is a time for local businesses to really shine their light and technology allows us to do that, to expand quickly and be <laughs> able to export our services also at a, at a faster rate. And Sean, do you, will the future of supply chain really be everything about technology we hear. You know, people when they say the future of supply chain, they think about technology. Is it really that? Or are there other trends that you see when it comes to the future of supply chain? I think technology will play an increasingly larger part in, in, in the supply chains. We, we are increasingly moving from a sort of physical analog world into a more digital one, but so people consume physical products, so there will always be, you know, the need to have, you know, we, we have to have an existence in the physical world. Even, yeah. even drop off Amazon, we're still buying physical products. They still have to move and be stored and be shipped and, you know, be consumed and be planned. But we are increasingly using technology to handle a lot of those items. So because the sort of the, you know, the, the velocity of data that we can see into our businesses, the variety of that data, the volatility of the marketplaces, it's making it more increasingly more difficult for or humans to sort of manage that, that increasing level of complexity. So we're relying on technology to do some of the heavy lifting, both the, both in terms of manual tools, but also in terms of intellectual tools, like, you know, advanced planning systems and decision intelligence tools, those sorts of things. But I think the other interesting mega trends that are taking place are, I think, you know, there, there was an urbanization movement happening. There is, you know, people are getting married later in life. There was a break away from sort of more traditional values. Sort of and structures of sort of get married young, have, you know, have a large family to people, specifically women, you know, moving and having their own careers. And then, you know, so there was an urbanization movement when linked into that urbanization movement is the push for net zero, which is specifically in the West is creating a drive for what they're calling sort of 15 minute cities where everyone has everything they need to within 15 minutes of them. Wow. It means it's walking distance, not driving distance because they want they got something called ULEZ, so it's ultra low emission zones where, where the, you know, there's parts of the urban centers mm. without cars effectively. So that's, that's a big mega trend. And it's, of course, that's all linked into the sustainable and net zero trend of, of trying to, again, locally source and move from, 
and specifically in the West, trying to move very much from sort of a, a meat-based diet into a more plant-based diet and growing things locally. And uh, you know, there's, a, there's a number of mega trends that are all sort of tied together, I think. And technology is one of just one of those tools that has sort of enabled us to connect the dots between them, really, and provide information at, you know, at the speed of the decision-making that we need to take in order to be able to put the right things in the right place at the right time. Yeah, no, that's that's actually quite interesting. And Sean, we often hear, and probably the people who are listening, they might have heard this term VUCA world. And mm-hmm. they're yeah. not sure, like, really, what what does it mean, VUCA? Where is this? Is it a volcano that is erupting somewhere <laughs> in the world? <laughs> well, like, well so what is this term, VUCA world? Please explain. Well, and it's, and it's interesting you mentioned volcano, actually. And I, haven't, I haven't actually made that association, but I think it's starting to come back. There was, if you remember the Icelandic volcano that erupted back in the two, early 2000s? That was kind of the start of the, these sorts of terms being used. We said suddenly the world went from being very stable, everyone was flying everywhere, and you could kind of predict exactly what was going to happen into... Oh, hang on a second. I'm, I'm switching on the news and there's been a volcano erupted in, in somewhere, you know, thousands of miles from where I live, but apparently it's affecting me now. So that thing, something happening, you know, somewhere else is affecting me. That, that never used to happen before. Everything used to be very local. I was only really affected by the things that were around me. And this is the point of the, the, the world is very, it's become very global and the sort of globalization movement was embraced very quickly. But of course, in terms of, you know, global supply chains also have global risks. Yeah. And it really, UCA really came out. I first heard it in 2009 at a Gartner supply chain event in London, just after the global financial crash. And, and Gartner were using it to describe the very nature of the world. And VUCA stands for, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it was really used to say, you know, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy, as the saying goes, you know, the world has suddenly changed very much in a very short period of time, specifically a financial crash. It's actually a military term. It's, it's, it's come to the US military. It's, it's basically used to describe sort of a very uncertain and volatile environments that you have to be able to make strategic decisions in. But it's been used again and again and again by consultants, really, to try and describe the fact that, you know, we live in this very uncertain, very volatile world. I've always took a little bit of umbrage, the constant use of the word. Not so, I have no issue with it being used, but I have a lot of issue with people using it without understanding why, why? we live yeah. in a bigger, bigger world. And certainly one of the things that was driving me to write Transition Point, really, was, was part of that, you know, answer the question, why is it so disruptive right now? I mean, I started work in the 1980s. It, it didn't seem so disruptive like that. The 1990s seemed relatively stable, but now everything, it feels like everything's changing so fast. Yeah. And, and there's, co- there's always something new to be worried about or some new disruption that, you know, it, it is, it feels very buka, you know, it feels very volatile and certain complex and ambiguous, but why, why, why is that the case? And that, that was one mm-hmm. of the things that also intrigued me, but also I never heard anyone really explain. And the reason they didn't explain it is because if I'm honest, they didn't know. And that's why my book is that thick. That's yeah. what I've explain. <laughs> never explained all this thing. <laughs> Worth it, worth it. And Sean... <laughs> Well, we are living in a very volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world, the VUCA world. And I think it's also an opportunity. So, Sean, do you think it is an opportunity? Do you think it's a threat? And how do you see, how can business owners, especially small business owners, thrive on that in this either threat or opportunity scenario? Um. Henry Ford had a very famous quote that said, whether or not you think you can or you can't, you are right. And I think I'm going to par- take that quote and sort of paraphrase it. If you, if you think it's, if you think this world is a threat or an opportunity, you are right. Because mm-hmm. your mind's around it that completely dictates your response to it. So if you see it as a threat, then you're going to protect yourself and, and act in a way that's very, very close to mind and trying to protect what you already know and protect your current job. If you see it as an opportunity, then you should be very open of mind and constantly looking for new ways to do new things and embracing it. So, uh, you know, it is both dependent on the person and dependent on the mindset of that individual. You, if you think this is a threat to your current job, it's probably going to be a threat to your current job. Mm. If this is an opportunity for you to create a new job, a better job, it's an opportunity for you to create a new one. Yeah. 
So I would suggest that it is both. And and you know the if if you like I say if you believe it's it's a threat, you'll act in that way that makes it a threat. And if you believe it's an opportunity, then I'm sure you will grab the opportunity as well. That's very important. It's how you it's how you see it, you know, because sometimes what you think or your perspective, it, it, it changes the scenario because if you go with it thinking that, ah, my business won't survive, this is, this is going to take, take my job away. It's going to take it. But if you think, okay, this is an opportunity. How can I participate? How can I get the knowledge? How can I invest on my skills so that I'm ahead of the trend? Then you will probably most probably thrive on it. So. I think, Absolutely. and that's, and that's one of the things I'm a big advocate of is get, get the right knowledge and thrive on it. Because if you have the knowledge, if you know the insights, no one can take that away from you. They won't come anyone to say, look, no, you're, uh, you are behind or we have to replace you because you're always constantly updating yourself to what's happening Correct. in the industry, what, what's happening in supply chain. How can you be a master of what you, of your craft? So there is no replacing for that. And no, I think Sean, one yeah. of the, sorry, I mean, it's like one of the, one of the, one of the real statements I make to people when they talk about this is, you know, the, there is a benefit, I think, if you're younger, because in, in a lot of cases, the challenge for a lot of older people is the unlearning of existing ways of thinking, mm -hmm. existing practices. And of course, if you're younger, you just on focus on the learning bit, not the unlearning bit. But the, I think one of the key messages I like to say is people have to come really comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah, yeah. and and because people seek seek the status quo and they seek comfort and, and you know they want the world to be stable and nice and they want it to, everything to stay as it is and it's it's just not going to happen yeah. so you have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable and actually learn to thrive through that uncomfortable you know if you look at the financial markets you know uncertainty in the financial markets creates huge amounts of volatility, but that volatility for some people makes, allows them to make huge amounts of money. They yeah. thrive on volatility. And I think that's how we need to be. We need to thrive through volatility really, because it's going to be a volatile market out there, but it's going to create huge amounts of new opportunities to learn new things. And if you, if you are comfortable with the fact that you're not going to know the answers, that you're not going to have all the solutions and that actually mm. you're going to go into situations, not knowing how to, this is going to pan out and not knowing what it is you need to know. But if you go into that, believing that it's capable to find that out and seek the answer, not expect to have it at the start, then actually you'll thrive through that situation. No, that's, that's so true. That's so key. I, I, I love what you say. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable and the world won't change. I think we need to put this in mind. The world will continue going in this way. It will continue to be uncertain. We'll continue to be volatile. We just have to change our mindset and that's it, period. Otherwise we'll stay behind. And Sean, there are some bubbles that I need you to burst. <laughs> okay, let's go for it. <laughs> so there's some myth, <laughs> you know, people, cows we need to kill them. Yeah, just... <laughs> like something, do you just need to clear out, you know, because okay. people like when they think about this stuff that I'm going to say, they're like, it's true. Even I thought of that. Even I thought of that, but I'm, I've been renewed. I've been set free from the mindset. <laughs> <laughs> so the first myth that people have is that robots will replace my job. Is that true, Sean? Will robots replace people's job? Yes. If I'm honest, <laughs> they will replace people's jobs. They, with not all jobs, and they will also create new jobs. So. You know, there is, there's something called the lump of labor fallacy, which says there's only a set number of jobs in the world. And once if machines do those jobs, then there'll be nothing left for humans to do. Now that has been believed to be the case for a very long time, but, but we used to all work in the agricultural industry. Most people, 70% of the population used to work in agriculture. Now that's 1% work in agriculture. So is everyone else out of a job? No, of course not. There are new jobs. There are. There are jobs working, you know, you, you, from everything from being a social media influencer through a digital marketer to a podcaster. There are a whole host of different jobs that simply just didn't exist before. So yeah. we'll replace all jobs. Absolutely. Specifically, if those jobs are repetitive, if they're rules-based, if they are dull or what they call 3Ds, if they're dull or they're dangerous or, and uh, 
and, and and basically, you know, anything like that that was can be replaced by a machine will be replaced by a machine. So if you're hanging your future on being the life support system for a pair of hands, and all you can do is pick things up and move it, your job is going to be replaced. <laughs> Not all jobs. So there are jobs actually that are, do involve a pair of hands that are actually incredibly creative. So I use the analogy in my book and, and this with, about the plumbing industry, being a plumber. I, when I was writing the book, I had my bathroom replumbed and I spoke to the, uh, to the plumber who was doing that. And I said, look, yeah, I'm writing this book about technology and the impact it has on, on, on the world, specifically the world of employment. Could you imagine a robot? doing your job and he, he sat and he thought about it for a little bit and he said look i can imagine a robot making everything that i use like it could make the tiles that i lay it could make the pipes that i fix it could make the, the bathrooms that i install mm. but i cannot in a world where a, a robot would come into a house as given that most houses are different and you know understand the plumbing understand you know be able to remove all of these items take the tiles off the wall mix the grout put them up it's an incredibly complex set of tasks that have to be put together and, and a lot of which are, are quite physically intensive. So you're, you're decades away before we have robot plumbers. It would even ever want robot plumbers. And if you think about even the fact that we're building houses now, which are, have more standardized plumbing and we have those things yeah. that maybe 3D printed houses that have plumbing built in, this sort of stuff. There's every house that has ever been made up until this point in time that will still need to be maintained and repaired. So I had a discussion, I did a presentation in the UK to a series of teachers and, and higher education specialists. And one of the teachers came up to me afterwards and said, you know, how, how do we, how do we stop my students from talking about being a plumber? Cause their dad was a plumber and their granddad was a plumber. How do we, how do we stop that? And I, and I said, well, why would you? Yeah. Cause actually plumbing is one of the, the things that is going to have a long term future. Your challenge as an educator is does not stop them from thinking of just being a plumber, but actually, how do I set up a, a successful plumbing business? How do I yeah. learn the money management skills and the entrepreneurship skills and the time management skills needs to, to create a business and then the customer service and the marketing skills to grow that business? You know, those are the skills you should be teaching. Plumbing is an, is a requirement that's going to be around, you know, for a very, very long time. So your skill is to take people from just being, I am a plumber to I run a plumbing business, yeah. you know, very successful plumbing business. And that's the mindset shift because we will always need people to do those sorts of jobs. So yes, robots will take jobs, but not all jobs. Robots will also create new jobs. We don't know what they are yet necessarily. Some of which we do, some of which we don't, but there are also jobs that we are robot proof. So I think that's a yeah. complicated, that. very simple Thanks. question, but <laughs> yes, yes. And I like what you say is it's going to create new jobs. I was thinking now, for example, social media manager, it's a job that you didn't have 30 years ago or even 20 mm. years ago. It came Probably now with the, increase, yeah, with the rise of social media and platforms. Now you need a social media manager, but before it didn't exist. So right. now we're going to have more of that. With, I feel people are creating also in their own space going into what they are more, how can I say, what they're more prone and what they're very skilled at and they're thriving in that industry. So we shouldn't think that it's, you know, just to get stuck in, into where we are and say that we're uncomfortable there, but also upscale our skills. What is the market need? How can I be better than I was before or what my, even my peers in the industries are doing? So, so that I don't get comfortable in that position. And Sean, the second one is robots are more intelligent than humans. Is that true? Depends on the human. <laughs> wow, please explain. <laughs> <laughs> no, the ro I mean, a, ro a robot is a tool. It's, it's, it, we, we are getting increasingly smarter robots, which is really meaning that the, the software that goes into the robotics is getting better. It can. You know, they, they can see, they can sense their environments, they use vision, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, but they're still a tool and, and, and we still control the tools. So, you know, hu humans are, are, you know, robots are not smarter than humans at this particular point in time. We have, we are in an exponential growth curve. So the idea of robots not being smarter than humans in the future is probably something that, you know, we challenge and think of because of the rate of progression, but right now. 
no, they're a, they're a tool to do something. We we are about to enter a new phase of technological development. These robots will become into move into areas that they previously haven't moved into at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But I go back to my previous point. You know, if 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 you if you're competing against a robot that picks things up and moves things around, then maybe there's a this is an opportunity for a better job than picking things up and moving things around. Yeah, yeah. Again, it goes back to the upscaling part. So. You are, if you're hearing this and you think a robot was smart, don't worry, it's not. <laughs> it's a tool. Well, yeah, okay. I go back. I go back to the previous <laughs> point. The challenge is if you are just simply, you know, a life support system for these, and that's all you're doing. You're just pure manual labourer. Then, then job is a risk. That career is a risk. So you have to offer more. Yes. There has to be, and that's good for you as as well, much as it is for your employer, because ultimately it's. Doing a, a repetitive, dull, dangerous job is, is, you know, it's, it's not that exciting, is it? You know, you know, you want, want to, you should aspire to more to and, more. and here's the opportunity. Yeah. And, and if you like to, I mean, Kevin Kelly took once to talk about, you know, if you can create a thousand fans for what you do, you can make a career out of it. So, you know, if, as you're a podcaster, if you can create a thousand people who constantly listen to your podcasts and, and uh, listen, you know, hang on to your words. Then that's a size where, you know, you can create a revenue stream, you can attract sponsors, you can, and, and it creates that sort of snowball effect. And if you can have combined that activity with something that you actually believe in and are passionate about, then that's a much more rewarding life than actually just, you know, being, lifting things up and putting things down for, exactly. for some minimum wage. Exactly. And Sean, another, another thing that I want you to clarify is, or if it's true or if it's false. Will robots downgrade people's salaries? Because some people might think, okay, since a robot is doing like a job that 30% of my job, so I shouldn't earn that 30%, they will take that 30% out. So I have to do just 70%, so I'll earn just like 70% of the cut. Will that happen? Or is that a misconception people have? <laughs> the answer is very much similar to the previous question really, which is it's, it's not black and white. It's not linear. Again, if, if you're a truck driver and we move towards autonomous trucks as we are doing, then the salaries for truck drivers will go down and ultimately the trucks that drive themselves will be doing goods rather than drivers. At the moment, people have realized that truck driving is not a particularly attractive proposition and actually most of the truck drivers are getting older and retiring specifically in the West which created a shortage for truck drivers. And suddenly we saw an explosion in salaries for truck drivers. So truck driving yes. all of a sudden because of the e COVID and e-commerce and the need to move goods around because everyone starts shopping online. So suddenly a, 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 a career which had a sort of salary regression suddenly had a, you know, a significant bump in, in average pay rates. So it's not, it's never black and white, but if you can combine you know, new technology, digital technologies with your own capabilities, then I think there's a synergistic effect that kicks in that says, actually the opportunity for me from a salary perspective is greater than just myself on my own or machines on that. Yes. The future, the future basically really is theirs to the taking for people who can combine those two things together. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's it. What you said, it's really going above and beyond doing more to add value. And just now bringing a little bit here in Africa, and when it comes to technology development, Africa is definitely catching up to the rest of the world. Not catching up, but really, it's really, how can I say, it's shining a light, you know, it's, it's, getting, it's getting there. And for you, Sean, what are some of the key advice that you would give to African supply chain leaders to de differentiate themselves in the global market. You spoke about the 15 delivery, like a 15 minute walk where people can get everything within 15 minutes, delivery, getting their groceries, buying this and that. So just 15 minutes distance. Sometimes here people have to walk hours in order to have basic services, you know? Mm. So what is some advice that you can give to African supply chain leaders in organizations, be it NGOs? but also in the private sector? It's an interesting question. I, I've written a couple of times because of my sort of links with Africa on 
you know, how leaders can, it's going to embrace this particular opportunity by not, not necessarily, you know, following what the West does and thinks it has to go through the sort of same path, but actually you're know, using technology to, you know, to leapfrog in the same way that countries like Kenya, for example, uses M-Pesa to move straight to mobile banking yes. without having to go for digital banking. There wasn't, there was no banks and, and we didn't have to go through this long history that we had in the West of having your know, banks and checks and, and these systems, you've gone straight to a, a effectively a mobile banking system. So you almost leapfrog. And in that leapfrogging, you demonstrated the opportunity really, which is you're not weighed down by people who are attached to the old paradigm. You can jump straight to a new paradigm. Mm-hmm. Now there are certain paradigms that you can't avoid. So if you had, as you said, an infrastructure that's you know, in disarray and then disrepair. So if your road structures are, are, and there's a, then that of course, obviously inhibits the ability to be able to, you know, to move things long distances for autonomous vehicles, to be able to drive on the roads if the road itself is not particularly stable, etc. Yes. But I would kind of really hope that African leaders would look at these technologies and think, how can I use them and apply them to the context of the environment upon we which in order to add value to the to the people in this environment and what they understand what they value, which will be very different to what is valued in the U S or in Europe, exactly. for example, and use these technologies to deliver that value to them in the most efficient and effective way possible. And not to just think, look across to say, what did they do in the U S and what did they do in Europe? Then then try and replicate that. So mm. there's a lot of that unlearning that has to be done in the Western Europe. And I think you can really take advantage of that but while people are struggling with letting go of the past you can focus very much on on the future because you haven't got that same sort of structure in place at the moment and just look at these technologies and think how can we use these technologies to deliver that value in the context of the environment upon you which and you live knowing what the people who live there value so i think it's there's great opportunity enormous opportunity for african leaders really to not just play catch up but to overtake Yes, yes. And, you know, Sean, I was doing this series on the podcast on LinkedIn where I was highlighting supply chain heroes of Africa and, and I looked upon many startup companies in Africa. It's so amazing to see how technology has been paramount in terms of these companies growing in the industry, growing regionally, because they've used mm-hmm. methods like, for example, Uber and Amazon type of models and they've adapted to the African market and they're thriving in their own right. So exactly what you're saying, it is, it's being applied and companies are thriving on that, in that sense. And I think there's so much, so much opportunity available for African supply chain leaders to really, to really take over. I can say, you know, the models have been there. Now we just have to apply it. To, to, to our own scenario, to our own characteristics, because it's different. As you say, it is different from the U.S. It's different from the U.K. Yeah. Our, our way of seeing, because one of the things that I've realized as well is that culture plays a major role in terms of business or how to do business on how customers view it. And you, one of the things that you say is that it's the future of supply chain is going to be very much personal, you know. So how do we touch people at their point of need? What do they really want? And I think that's, that's the opportunity that we really need to capture and actually tell those stories. Cause another thing is that some companies are doing really amazing things out there, but they don't have a platform <laughs> to showcase, yeah. yeah, to showcase their solutions, what their struggles and challenges so that others can see and be like, oh, it's possible. And I think that's one of the things that. I think we need to see African supply chain leaders need to see is that it's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is. I think, you know, goes back to my previous point, you know, whether you think you're, you can or you can't, you're right. Yeah. It is, but it is possible. It is possible. Absolutely. And I think that's a great opportunity really for, for me. I mean, if you, there's also the fact that sometimes the lack of sort of heavily regulated system enables you to be able to be more creative, to take more yeah. risks. Yeah. So if your, if your roads are in a state of disrepair, then maybe you can use other technology. So when I, I, I did some work just before COVID in Nigeria, where mm-hmm. I was working for the Bill and Melinda Gates Association and the Association of Supply Chain Management and the Global Fund, sort of on the malaria elimination program. And there was, there was great talk about using drones to be able to move 
you know, all, all these malaria treatments into areas that were relatively inho inhospitable, you know, normally because of you know, either security issues or the roads weren't so good. And, and that was, and let's get on it. Let's do it. You know, the, what, whereas in the UK or in the Europe, well, you we need to this regulation and that regulation and yeah. what just happened, what that happened. Whereas, you know, you were able to just leapfrog straight into that particular solution, you know, and actually, you know, we have this technology now, why don't we just use it? That circumvents the problem that we're facing and we can just use it. And you can do that. And it almost reminds me in some respects of the sort of, almost like the start of the industrial revolution in back in, in the, uh, in the 18th century, really, where, you know, where people were just coming together and having ideas and let's just do this. Let's, there was yeah. no one sort of stopping them from doing it. And I think if you've read, you've read my book, as you obviously have, so that's one of the, was one of the major catalysts behind the industrial revolution was the ability to be that entrepreneurial, to take those risks. Yeah. To, to to basically bring men of invention and investment and industry together into a room or, or coffee shop and basically just say let's just go and do it and yeah. being able to and I think Africa has exactly that opportunity you know just just to sound like a Nike slogan just do it yes yes <laughs> yeah that's so true Sean and Sean in terms of this just gearing towards my last question now. You know, what you just say, just do it. And we do have that. It's the, it's the part of the mindset on how we look at things. Is it now the responsibility of the organization to develop their employees to become par in terms of upscaling their skills so that they can answer to those market demands into what the supply chain of the future is requiring, or is it the responsibility of the supply chain professional to do that. I, I think it's both, and I think it always has to be both. If if you are the, the the organization and you're relying on the individual, well, what happens if the individual doesn't do that? You've got to go. Yeah. You've got to be full of people who are, don't have the skills for the future. If you're an individual and you rely on the company, well, what happens if the company doesn't invest in it? You're stuck in an organization that isn't advancing you. So. You have to take responsibility for your own progression and the company has to take responsibility for its own success. Mm -hmm. If you can put those things together and create an environment where people can actually learn the skills needed to be successful long-term and in doing so grow the success of the company you work for, then you're onto a winner. It's, it's a bit like the old, the, the old sort of analogy, isn't it? You know, with the CFO saying. You know, what, what happens if we invest all this money in training and the people leave and the CEO says, well, what happens if we don't train them and they stay? Exactly. You know, it, it's kind of that sort of thing. So it's, it, it's both really. You have, you have to not rely on an organization to basically secure your own individual future. And the organization also has to rely, not rely on the individuals in order to secure its future. So you can, but both of those need to come together. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's both of them coming together to actually to not only develop yourself as a professional and organization, but also you're contributing to the betterment of the economy of the industry, because now you have better professionals, you have knowledgeable professionals, know what they're doing and getting yeah. the right education and getting the right knowledge. And I think, it all, yeah, it all starts with, with knowledge. Hey, Sean, because. You can try and tell people do this, do that, but then if they don't know, it's pointless. You know, mm -hmm. you can try to implement a new system, but then if the people in your organization, if your suppliers, they don't, they don't know, they have no idea how to do it. It renders useless at times and it becomes yes. very frustrating. So it's very important to invest on that knowledge, investing on the skills giving people that entrepreneurial mindset, not only just because they need to start a business, but also for within the organization, they can spearhead new projects to improve and also encourage that within the employees that, you know what, this is your project, do it, you know, take ownership of that. And I think that's, that's really what's going to take us into a whole nother level. No, I would agree. I, yeah. I would agree. I mean, and it's never been easier than it is right now to be able to acquire that knowledge before knowledge was limited to books. And those books mm. were usually in the location of, of people with money or institutions, and you had to go there to get knowledge. Now, of course, you can listen to, you know, wonderful podcasts like this for free and, and learn this knowledge. You know, yeah, you can no. go online, you can go on YouTube, you can use You can like buy transition points. Buy transition points. You can. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, knowledge, knowledge now has never been more, you know, more freely available than it than it is right now. When, when we're reaching a very sort of like an epoch at the moment with tools like you know Chat GPT, where we can almost yeah. just we say out loud our question and the answer is presented for us. And the real challenge is not just to rely on that, for that to sort of drive to more questions that leads mm -hmm. to more answers, that creates more knowledge. And one thing I've always, always sort of said is the danger of sometimes is that, you know, knowledge has, you know, has no value unless it's applied. We always use the words that oh. knowledge is power, but yeah. unless you apply that power, it, it's, it's relevant, uh, you know, to give a very, uh, a very, probably quite cheap analogy, but if, you know, if I, if I bought a lot, if I knew what the winning lottery tickets were for tomorrow's lottery in the UK, <laughs> I'm not a millionaire unless I went out now before the lottery and bought that ticket. Yeah. You know, so knowledge in itself doesn't make me a millionaire. It's only when it's applied and Fine. it's executed that actually it actually adds something. So that and, and people are very scared about that bit. They're not they 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 listen and learn, but they don't know actually to take the next step to actually take the risk to start to apply that knowledge to create a podcast, for example, or to put yourself out there. It can be very daunting. But you know, no one else is going to secure your future but you. That's very yes. true. So take that risk. You know. Yeah, that's very true. And Sean, just a little and to and just a little word of encouragement to our supply chain professionals. What what is one of your biggest, how can I say, takeaway and advice for us going into? I saw this was I think I'm not sure the professor he released this book about supply chain of the 2020s, how to thrive in the supply chain of the 2020s. But how, what's your key advice, John, for it to survive in this? Well, I, I think, yeah, I think my key, my key advice is that there is, and I think I mentioned this at the start, you know, the, the, it's easy to look at the volatility and the uncertainty in the supply chain disruptions as a threat, but it's also good to look at the volatility and the disruptions, and the uncertainty as an opportunity. And there has never been a better time to be in supply chain. Supply chain used to be a backroom activity. Supply chain was always the thing that, you know, we used to say was uh, invisible because you, no one was interested in it only w unless it went wrong. So you only ever heard about the supply chain when the supply chain went wrong. So yeah. it never got a seat on the board. It never got really the attention it wanted. Whereas now supply chain is seen as mission critical to business. Supply chain leaders sit on the board. We have chief supply chain officers. It's yeah. seen as being strategic, not just operational and transactional. So. You know, this, this is a very exciting time to be in supply chain because it's no longer seen about just the, 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 the shifting of goods and services and a and one way linear path, but actually about, you know, creating a value network that's a, completely linked to the business strategy that you've seen as an enabler of business value, not just a collector of costs. So, you know, if you're in supply chain right now and you're feeling down, don't, you know, but realize that you're actually in, in the. You know, you might feel like you're in the center of the hurricane at the moment, but that hurricane at least is going somewhere, you yeah. know, so, you know, embrace the opportunity because right now, you know, it's a good place to be. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you so much for your word of advice. It has been such a wonderful conversation here on the podcast. And Sean, how can people get in touch with you if they want to talk to you more? How can they get in touch with you? Sure. I have a, a, an admittedly quite poorly out of date website, which again, <laughs> uh, is seancuny.com. I think, I think the last time I updated it was about four years ago and I'm feeling quite bad about that now, actually, you mentioned it, but they can reach me on Sean at seancuny.com or they're almost welcome to link out, to link up to me. There is only one Sean Cooley, so you're not going to get another one. <laughs> there is only one Sean Cooley in the world. So if you want to reach out to me and connect with me on LinkedIn, I'd be delighted to do that as well. Yes. And guys, Sean is very open very open to talk and his book again transition point for me it really opened my mind when it came to the future of supply chain when it came to the waves that we went through that we are going through and that we will go through so sean thank you so much for writing that book for supply chain professionals it's it's what we must we what we must really look at and i even think i'm gonna read it a second time just you know i need to refresh <laughs> because it's still applicable to what we're living in right now. So thank you it's, so it's, much uh, for writing that pleasure. book. And I want the second edition. Oh, absolutely. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on that, Stella. I'm working yes. on it. Just, just think, for your, for your list of benefit, it, it's available on ebook and on audiobook as well. It, 
if you can stomach listening to me for quite a long time, then that, that I guy recommend the audiobook version as well. Yes, guys, please. There's also ebook. You can guys get it on Amazon. I got it from Amazon. So, <laughs> so guys, thank you, uh, thank you so much, Sean. So thank you everyone thank you, who Stella. has listened to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, subscribe. We have a YouTube page. You can subscribe to the channel. You can leave a comment. You also are on Apple Podcasts and all the major streaming platforms. We're also on Instagram and LinkedIn. Please make sure that you leave a comment on our post. So thank you very much for listening to the podcast and I'll see you next time.